Hey everyone, welcome to our uh, Stitch Era Liberty uh, training refresher from Coldesi. Uh, I'm here with uh, Sean, who is uh, waving at the um, at the video camera right now, which we're not <laughs> turning on today. Um, so uh, we're doing these training refreshers. This is the first one for Stitch Era, uh, specifically for you guys, because you know Sean is the main guy for uh, for answering those questions when you call, and we thought it would be a good idea to keep you fresh, um, show you some of the tips and tricks of using Stitch Era Liberty and answering some of the questions that we got in advance. Um, so if you, uh, if you have questions, you can just type them in at any time. We'll, we'll take a look at them as they come in. We may answer them now or we, we may save that till the end of the uh, webinar. Um, I also just want to remind everybody that this is not your official full Stitch Era Liberty training. Um, there are probably 12 hours worth of videos on the YouTube site and John Dunbar when you get your machine will go through and do some extensive training uh, online. This is strictly a refresher. So if you're not using the software now, that's that, that's fine. You'll probably pick up a few things, but just realize that, you know, you, you should get the full training done as well. Okay. Um, Sean, why don't you get started? All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Sean. Um, the biggest thing about digitizing that I usually get questions of are when should I use a fill, when should I use a satin, stitch direction, the density, what should I use. Um, all that depends on the fabric that you're sewing on. Uh, if you're digitizing for leather, you can have different density than you would if you're digitizing for uh, satin. Um, so basically, I'll go ahead and uh, import an image um, on the left side here. See if I just grab, uh, we'll say the sun with the sailboat drag that to my screen. Um, when looking at this design, the first thing you want to do before you start digitizing is I would size the image to what the finished product should be. For example, this one came in at roughly a little over eight inches wide. If this is going on a kid's shirt that's only five and a half inches, then you definitely want to come in here, select it, set your size, and left click from the left side to the right size of the image, and change that to five and a half inches. The reason you want to do this is if you are digitizing a design that is on screen 10 inches wide, get your showing up for left chest, a lot of your densities, your fill patterns, uh, the detail you're going to add to it is going to be a lot different from a jacket back to a left chest. So the, the first thing I would do is size your image to the size that you want to digitize it at. Me personally, I go ahead and move my image to where it's pretty much in the zero, zero mark centered, which is up here at the top, then over here at the left. And before I start digitizing, I always come over here to my images, and I lock the image. Why you want to lock the image is if you're digitizing and you select off the, an object, but accidentally grab your image and shift it or move it, you've now just shifted your image from your design You've got to sit there and get it back to line it up perfectly. And if you've digitized something for the last two hours and you've moved your image, you're going to be a little upset. That is a good one. So I go ahead and lock my image down by choosing the drop-down arrow key and choose lock. Uh, in looking at a design, you always want to start from the back and work your way to the top. So when looking at here, you see the sun is behind the sailboat and the waves are all by themselves. So you can do the waves, sun, and then the sailboat would be last. The reason you do that is because you can overlap the back object inside the sailboat. So when you come across from the sailboat, you digitize it, it's going to define the line between the two objects. You want to overlap because when it sews, the sun most likely will pull in, the sail will pull in this way, and you don't want a gap between the two colors. You want to be a nice, clean, defined edge. So the first thing I would do here is I would go ahead and choose my uh, hourglass and zoom into the area that I want to create. And looking at this, since this is a bitmap illustrated design, it is a lot cleaner, a lot sharper compared to a regular bitmap would be, would be really pixelated. Two ways you can do this sun. Up here in embroidery, you've got your path, column, uniform, uh, turning area, and your lettering. A path is a path to running stitch. You would use this to do detail around a design or to get from one section to another section uh, across an object. In the column fill, 
column with zigzag, this is your satin stitch. This is for small text, uh, regular size lettering, um, small detail in design, under, I would say, 8 millimeters in width, which is just about a quarter of an inch. Your uniform area is the area with pattern. This is your large filled sections. For example, the sun, the two sails, maybe the boat itself. Because it's a large area, you want to fill it with an uh, area with pattern. And when you choose an area with a pattern, you're able to choose the start point, the end point, and the stitch direction of the stitches. Um, for example, I'll show you what area with pattern. You can choose manually or auto trace. In auto trace, we'll go ahead and left click on the object. And you see it puts running ants around it. You can then choose your entry point, say at the top. Choose your exit point at the bottom. And then since we chose top to bottom, your stitch direction will be left to right. So, so Sean, is this actually where the machine will start embroidering in that design? That is correct. Okay, so it's going to start exactly, you're, you're where basically I tell telling it. where the machine, this is where I want the needle to hit first. Correct. And is there a reason that you picked the top? Um, yeah, usually when you look at a design, you're trying to look at it to where if you see it in actual, with your own eyes in life, if you look at a sign, Majority of the direction of it's going left and right. If it goes up and down, it's going to look oblong. Uh, right. So you can do it left and right. So you try to do your fill sections, or your, uh, I'm sorry, your stitch directions in the way you would perceive it as looking at it out, out there in, in, uh, in the public. Makes sense. Um, you know, for example, down here, the sailboat, well, the sails you'll probably do left and right because it'll give the, the illusion of it being uh, rounded so to speak, if you did it up and down, it would be oblong and look flat. You want to try to do your design to where when you sew it out, it looks 3D. So the stitch directions at different angles, when the light hits it, you get a different appearance. You get, your, you get your shading. So once you choose your start, your end, and your slope direction, you would hit the Enter key. It'll then go ahead and fill it out. I'll go ahead and clear this off. That's one way to do it. Uh, another way to... Uh, fill this section is if you did it manually, you choose your uniform area, area with pattern, choose manual, and you've got the option of doing curve or straight. And we will start off by placing our first point, going around our object. So why would you do this instead of auto trace? Um, if your image is pixelated uh, that the customer gave you, if um, it has shading in it, you want to define it yourself rather than doing a nice clean cut image. So if somebody hands you a business card with their logo on it and says, here, I want this on my polo. You're going to you know, scan it in, and then the artwork that you have is going to be kind of rough. So you would use this instead of Autotrace, because Autotrace wouldn't find all the edges. Correct. Okay. Or if it did, it would be very pixelated, and you'd have rough edges. You'd have to go back and, and edit it afterwards. And you tried doing it right the first time. Nice. So we'll go ahead and make this straight at the bottom. We'll go along our side. Come across the top to finish it. And you'll notice when you get close to the to when you started, you get what, what looks like appears a bullseye. When you get close and you see the bullseye by clicking, it will go ahead and close the object for you. Once it's closed, you do the same thing. You want your start point, say at the top your exit point at the bottom, and your stitch direction. And whenever you place your stitch direction, it could be anywhere in the design. It could be off to the side. It has nothing to do um, with the actual stitches except for the direction of the fill. So what I usually do is place it somewhere near the object I'm doing and getting the filled object. And as you can see, I overlapped inside the sail just a little bit. So when I do put the sail on, I'm going to come directly through this line to do the sail, and you'll get a nice clean edge between the two colors and no gap. Nice. <clears throat> can you preview that and, and, and see what the stitches look like? Yeah. Yeah, we can go up here. You go to View, go to Simulation, and you can make this window a lot larger to see it. And you can actually see the simulation of the stitches uh, the way it's going to sew out. Okay. So you can get a real-time view. And if for some reason you're doing an object and you want to save it as a JPEG, once it's done, you can do this real view. You come up here to save, 
can actually save this uh, simulation view to add it to the file so you show the customer. Uh, okay. So sailboat's a second color. This is your color over on the left-hand side. These colors are only for a visual preference. These colors do not necessarily mean you have to sew the design in these colors. Uh, you can actually change these colors by double-clicking on them to open up the color palette and say if it's a, a bluish green, click apply. You have this on the bluish green color. This is for a visual preference. Just because it shows this color on screen doesn't mean you've got to sew it in this color. Right, but now I noticed that you've got uh, look like Pantone and RGB colors. That is correct. There's, so if a customer gives you their logo colors, if you happen to have that one in 10,000 customers that knows what that means, exactly the same, then, then you can, you you can, can find that color and show what it might exactly. look like. So if they give you um, specific colors, you'll be able to find it, apply yep. it. So when you show them what their, their design looks like, they can physically see it in the exact colors of their design. That's great. Now, before you, before you go any further, Sean, would you explain the tools up, up on the left-hand side that we're looking at there? These uh, right here? Yeah. Yeah, you've got your designs, images, and motifs. Uh, designs are basically, if you came up here to go to File, Open, and Choose Your Designs, if you created. Uh, your images, which is where I've got the sun and the sailboat, these are images that come with your software that you can open up at any time and experiment, play with, get used to the stitches, get used to the tools. Uh, or if a customer gives you design and you save it in a file, you can load them in here, uh, certain folders, and keep adding to that folder. So every time a customer comes in, you can open up his folder and pull his exact file he gave you out. Right. Now, now also, the uh, people that buy their embroidery machines from Cold Essie get like 4,000 stock designs. Stock designs. <laughs> and some of them are even useful. Yeah, I mean, it ranges anywhere from sports figures to flowers to borders, uh, stars and stripes. And basically, you just open those up and add lettering to it or just sew them by themselves. Okay. They are already pre-digitized for you. Okay, so designs, uh, images, as well as motifs are like, uh, you know, if you're doing awards, this does like a banner, type in a name, uh, borders. If you're doing a border, put, you know, um, Happy Mother's Day and then do a poem in there with text. You can sew that out for her, put it on a nice cloth, blanket, frame it, and hand it to her on Father's Day. And if you got the uh, the uh, patch kit designs from Coleman and Company, would they show up here? Oh, uh, you could add them in there and add okay. in a folder and just and select, you know, so you can have design. all your patches and right. Yeah, anytime you load you load something, you be able to, you know, load them in here, frames, uh, balloons, blocks, patches, yeah, that's what great. have you, and be able to select them, drag it up to the screen, and then add simple text to it. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to. That's okay. To um, so far, we've done, say, this is a fill pattern. To do the waves, I'll go ahead and zoom into a wave and show you. In using the wave up here in embroidery, we did a uniform area for the sun. We're going to choose a column with a zigzag for the waves. The reason for it's a small area. If it was a large area, you would definitely do a fill pattern. With the column with a zigzag, uh, basically, Rather than outline the object, you're going to do a zigzag pattern, basically an up and down or down and up. It has to have two pairs, has to have a pair of points as you go around. These pair of points here or here actually define the angle of stitches at this particular point in the design. Unlike a fill section, a fill section you've got one direction, the whole object is filled in that direction. In doing a satin stitch, you are defining the direction as you go around the object. And what's the advantage to that? It gives it a different look. Um, even though you see I've got it curved this way, when the light hits it, it'll give you a different effect of the shading, the shadowing. Okay. It gives you the depth or 3D look on an object. Um, a satin stitch will puff out a little more than a fill stitch. A fill stitch looks flat. Satin stitch looks puffed. Okay. So if you're doing a design, you've got a fill stitch in the background, yet you put highlights or shadows or shades on top of it in a satin stitch, it gives you the effect that the design is in 3D and gives you the, got it. Uh, a different look. Okay. So as you can see, the stitches that I placed, you can see as it turns, as it goes around. Uh, a good way to look at this is think of it as an imaginary line running through the middle of your design. The pair of points you place that line should be perpendicular to the object at that particular place as you go around. Okay. 
So if you got a circle, you're going to turn it as you go around the circle to give the effect of the stitches actually bending around the object. Gotcha. Select tool, and we'll turn stitches back on down here. You've also got a uh, looks like a thumb a thumbtack. If you click on this, this is also a, a real view of it, as well as going up to view and simulation. Um, and as you can see, I did the, the sun in orange, but I did the wave in blue. Wave should be a different color. Doesn't matter. You can come back afterwards, select it, just choose a different color on the left side. And if you choose blue, then you've got it in blue. Nice. I see the um, the highlight. It looks like it's highlighted on that on that wave. Yeah, you see the the, the shading. So when the light hits it, you're going to give the 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 effect of it as in 3D. Right. Um, once you're done with your logo, say you want to add text to it, we'll go ahead and pan down. It's a simple tool up here in your lettering stage. In lettering, you have digitized fonts and true type fonts. Digitized fonts are what came from the actual programmer that already created the font for you. Uh, when you choose the drop-down list, if it has only uppercase, it's strictly uppercase. If it has upper lower, it has upper lower. Some fonts have the special characters and other fonts. Um, and if a font you're choosing doesn't have a special character, type in your text, choose another font, choose a special character, and then paste it where you need to go. Uh, for example, say excuse Avante Grae. You've got bold, italicized in your font. You've got your size here. If you're typing in a size of, say, 0.85, you have to type in a 0 0.85. If you only type in 0.85, what happens is it doesn't register the point, and it throws it into 85 inches. <laughs> so it will take time to regenerate and, and, and cause you issues. So always make sure you type in a 0 point and then your number. Once you've got that, you click in the box. Say we'll type in sunset grill. Hit enter. We've got it on our screen. We can move it where we want to place it. Once you get it, since I want to do an arc around the sun, up here in the arrange, if we click on the drop down, you can you've got the option to rotate it, irregular, upper arc, lower arc, or a step text. I choose upper arc. The circle at the bottom of the, of the text, left click, drag it up to find your arc. The buttons on the side, left click and drag it in. And then drag it back down to place it on top of your, your design. And you can do kerning between the letters too, can't you? That is correct. You've got here, we choose this little icon. You've got uh, special characters, uh, digitized fonts, true type fonts, the space between your letters, words, lines kerning, how much kerning you want between the letters. Right. Uh, you've got lock stitches, trims, lock stitches on the words, or lock stitches and trims on all letters. You can choose this either before you put the text on screen or after. Okay. And you can do it for individual letters too, right? So you can just grab the little handle and move it. And move it, exactly, and move the letters. Um, if you notice, I've got jumps between the text. If you want it to be trimmed, you go up there and add trims, or these little scissors up here, you can tell I want to trim between letters and now your little lines are gone. So what's the, why would you leave those little lines in? If you're doing small text and you're not going to be able to see it jump between the letters, let the machine run at 700, 850 stitches a minute so that it's continuous. Otherwise, if the letters are really small, for example, say five millimeters, right. it's going to sew 30 stitches, stop, trim, pick up, move over. So 30 stitches, stop, trim, pick it's up. Gonna slow it it's going to slow the machine down. Got so by having it run, you might see between the letters in certain areas, but you can trim it out afterwards. Or larger areas, say between the T and the G, have it trimmed just between the T and the G, but let it run between the other letters. Okay. Um, your large jacket backs, you want to trim between each letter because you don't want to trim it out afterwards. Yeah. So you make it as easy as possible. You want the machine to make you the most money as possible. When it's not sewing, it's not making you money. So you want it to trim between large letters, but not between small letters. We'll go ahead and zoom out here. We've got Sunset Grill. Change the color. You can select it. Choose a different color. <clears throat> we'll come up here to View. Do a simulation. This gives you an idea of what it will look like after it sews. You can see down here we use a satin stitch. You've got light and dark areas. Depending on where a light 
will hit it will give you the effect of it, of it being 3D. You can see it uh, pretty evident in here, the text, which is uh, a satin stitch. Can you, now, can you change, if you saw this, and can you change the, the thread density? Is, for example, if I wanted that S to look a little bit more dense, how yeah, you, would you do something like that? You would go in here. Let me just move this off to the side to open up our object manager on your right-hand side. I can move this a little bit more. In here, these are the sections that we created. You've got your area pattern, which is your sun, your column zigzag, 209 stitches in this one, which is your wave, and then we have our text, which is the sunset grill. You would click on the plus next to it to drop down and show you each individual character you created. We would go to the letter S, click on it, and then down here is your body, shows you your stitch fill. We can actually increase this one, it's at 4.5. We can change that one to say 5.85. So now the density for the S is a lot thicker than the rest of it. You can add pull compensation, strictly chooses that letter, change the underlay for the letter, um, go to your border, fill mode, and then come down here and choose your entry and exit points if you want to choose for that letter as well. So you can get as detailed as you want. So what's the, what's the, what are the ramifications of what you just did for stitch density on the S? Is it, is it slower? Is it better looking? Like where, where does that, um, the stitch density, if you choose a lower number, say for example the 4.5, it's less stitches. Choose 5.5, it's thicker. If you're choosing small text, you definitely want to do a less density compared to if you're doing a quarter of an inch to half an inch to almost an inch lettering, you want more stitches to fill more area. Right, but also it, the lower the density, the faster it will sew out, is that right? Because there's less stitches. Um, So the question is, um, can you show, we had a question here that was, can you um, shorten the eye to define the dot in grill? I guess they, they want more separation between the dotted eye. Okay, so up here, you see it's, it's when it sews, this will push up, that will push up. So what we do is we come in here. That's really interesting to see it like that. <laughs> now, if you wanted to, you could do what you did before and remove the, uh, the stitch, stitch in between, correct? Between the eye? The eye, since this is a digitized font? No. No, because okay. it's digitized as that way from the programmer. Uh, let me go ahead and zoom out here. Good question, by the way. Choose here. Oops. There we go. So you're actually physically raising up where that stitch starts. That is correct. Because what it is is it's a program uh, letter I, so it's all grouped as one object. Which is why you got the okay. stitch right here. Yeah, right. So then what I would probably do is combine this and make those two come over each other so there's only one stitch between the two gotcha. rather than have two separate ones you've got to trim out afterwards. Cool, let's see the preview, see how it looks. And now you've got more defined. Definitely more definition. definition. Okay. So over here in your, in your right, your object manager allows you to look at each individual section, whether you need to change the density, add the underlay, pull compensation, which pull compensation, what it does, is I'll zoom into the wave to show you, is when this sews, what's going to happen is this is going to pull in. We'll change this to another color so that we can see it. These stitches are going to pull in, making it a lot thinner than what you probably want. So what we do is we come over here to our object manager, 
and come to pull compensation, you want to change it to proportional, and you want to change it to both sides. And right now the value is 21, and you can see how much larger it added the pull compensation by stretching out the, the satin stitches. Right. We digitized it here, yet it's pulling it out to here. So when it sews, these should pull in to the actual size of the object that you want it to appear at. Without this here, see, we'll just drop it to a 5. You can see it's barely outside what you digitized it at. So what's going to happen when this pulls in, it's going to be just inside the object. This is, you want to add pull compensation if you're doing lettering or satin stitches, especially on um, PK knit shirts, golf shirts, polos, men's uh, knit shirts, towels, blankets, because you want it to be thicker so it doesn't pull in and fall into the fabric and disappear. So is that because of the density of the fabric is different? Yes. Okay. If you're sewing on jean material or leather or um, a sturdy material, right. it's not going to pull as much as it would on a t-shirt, PK knit, towels because it's a very flimsy material. Gotcha. Interesting. So for garments like that, you want to add a little bit more pull compensation. Okay. Everybody get that? Okay. Close that. Um, another question I get, I'll go and open up another window here. Another question I get is somebody wants to do, uh, oh, we got a question here. Nope, that was just a Lorene saying yes. All right, cool. Thank you. Um, another question I get is, say you're doing um, name drops for, say, a baseball team, and you've got 20 names. All right. Well, rather than create 20 different files, have to load that into your, your embroidery machine with 20 different designs, an easy way to do it is we'll go ahead and come up to embroidery. We'll choose our lettering, and we'll say type in Steve. Here, we'll type it in Steve. Go ahead and press Enter. We will zoom in. We will take Steve, copy him, paste him in, and change Steve to now John. Change his color. Paste again. Place him back on top. Change Steve to Adam. Change his color. And basically you would keep doing this over and over and over and over. So what you'll have is 20 names stacked on top of each other in 20 different colors. So then you take this to your embroidery machine and you will type in uh, the manual color change. Put your first garment on. Load your design, set it color number one, we'll say it's white, press start. It sews John or so Steve, stops, pull that garment off, put your next garment on, press start, because it's still on white. Oh uh, right. Then you'll sew Adam. So you don't have to do that. 25 different individual embroidery files. Exactly. You've got one file, 20 names, each one a different color, and on your embroidery machine, just do it as a manual color change. That's great. Because you can have them all, all the same color. This is just the color, you're using the color to differentiate between one name and the next. Exactly, exactly. So this is a quick and easy way to do your 20 names, whether it be name drops, numbers, uh, names, yeah, that's abbreviations. Useful. It's the best way to do it right here. So you've got one design, 20 names, 20 different colors on your border machine. Choose manual color change, and away you go. It stops for each color. That's terrific. <laughs> delete that off here. Um, now in the embroidery, like I said, your path with running stitch, what this does, this allows you by placing a your left mouse button, allows you to either add underlay to a design yourself or manually come in here and go from one section to the next section between objects. Uh, let me pull a design up on screen to show you. Yeah, why would you add an underlay? There we go. If you mean you want to do it rather than have, them, have the computer do it for you automatically. Okay. Uh, let's say you're looking at the cow. And the horns you're going to do first. I'll go ahead and lock my image down so I don't move it. Is, let's say you come over here and 
You choose your column fill. We'll go ahead and place our points. We're going to overlap inside the black area because the black, when it comes on top, will actually define between the two colors. Now, rather than have the machine trim, pick up, move over, and come over here, I'll simply just go to my embroidery, grab my path, path of the running stitch, click where I left off, and simply just run over to the next section. Go back to my embroidery, choose the column, place my points over here to define this area. and so forth. So when I come across with my next color, say it would be here, it's actually going to cover up this running stitch. You'll never see it. Yet the machine stayed at 850 stitches a minute running from here to this side. So it just saves the machine from stopping, trimming, picking up, move over. I mean, you're talking a few seconds, but if you've got a large design with several sections, seconds add up to minutes, minutes add up to how many jobs you have. Yeah, especially if you're doing 100 of these. Exactly. Right. You want the machine to run as fast as possible, for as long as it can. Right. So that would be the running stitch for the path to jump between sections. You just simply click where you, where you ended, run over the next section, hit enter to end it, fill your next section or do your satin stitch and what have you. Same thing here. If you want to run down, you just simply run to this down here, do this one in this color, run up to here, do this in this color. Then when you come across with the cream, the two purples and the black, that defines the rest of the cow you'll never see this running stitch underneath. Right. Now, if this is a black color or a red color and all this up here is white, then simply just run along the edge down the black because you won't be able to see that color underneath the black anyway. Do we have any questions so far? Um, somebody did have a question about fonts again. Um, you mentioned that there was um, digitized fonts. How about true type fonts? Okay, true type fonts are fonts you have loaded on your computer, whether it be from Illustrator, Microsoft Word, they have to be true type fonts. In your true type font list, which you can see here, I've got a bunch of them I've got loaded on this computer, you've got a, a endless amount of fonts that you can get from your computer or from the web that are free. Once you load the true type fonts, it's simply just select the font, which is this one is uh, hollow, choose whether you want to be bold, italicized, choose your size, and type in that font. It will convert it to stitches automatically. Okay. So why would you then want pre-digitized fonts? What's the what's the advantage? Are there so I know that on, on the rhinestone side, uh, because of the nature of rhinestones that there are some true type fonts that just look terrible. Yes. Is that true for embroidery as well? Some of them, yes. Because some of them you gotta remember the true type fonts are meant for programs like Microsoft Word, Illustrator. Corel Draw. They're not meant for embroidery. All you're doing is you're taking an image, converting it to stitches. Right. So depending on how the programmer wrote the true type font, depends how it's going to convert it to stitches. So if it's thin in areas, big in others, it might not it might not convert properly and give you you know twisted stitches or not. Okay. All right. We have another question. Okay, so it looks like, uh, how would you make shaded lettering? So if the top of the letter was dark, if the bottom was light, or something along those lines. Okay. Um, for example, up here. That's a good question, by the way. Uh, just to give an example. In column fill, when you're creating your text, let's see. We got that one. We got here. Choose. Can you do it with true type or, or a digitized font, or is that already done for you? Yeah, that's already done for you. Okay, so, um, so if you wanted to do this kind of effect, mm -hmm. you would need to start with an image font. An image font, right. Okay. So what you'd have to do is come up when you go to embroidery and choose your column. Yeah. Over here, you've got your variable density. You've got your one color grading, your two color blending, as well as three color blending. Okay. So for example, you want to choose something that's pretty much half and half or more of a shading. And when placing your points, you've got the shading effect going from one color to the next. Okay, so you could have used this with the sun as a fill. As yes, I could have. Yeah, you just basically load up the sun, and it's, it goes the same way with uh, the, um, the area with pattern, is you just choose your variable density, 
and I want it to fade from one color to the next. Okay. And it would have faded from, say, a, a bright orange to a bright yellow. So when it sews, it saves you from doing it twice. Gotcha. It's so, one continuous object. So the, the main point here is that if you want to do some kind of shading like that, you cannot use true types or pre -did. You can't actually use fonts. You have to use a picture of a letter. Correct. Would you click on the question box again, oh, yeah. and let's see if there's a... we got here. How do you fix the true type fonts that convert poorly? Um, basically, what I do is, is I've noticed that some of the fonts I've, I've loaded in, you type in a name, for example, the, the word pool. It'll do the P good. It'll do the L good. The O's, it doesn't convert. I basically just look at an image and digitize the O's myself. Because they are true type fonts, so they're meant for other programs, you're trying to take an image and convert it automatically using the software. Yeah. Um, so in that case, what you do is uh, either open up the image with that font and digitize these letters separately, okay. or just digitize the letters that didn't convert correctly. Majority of the time, it is just one or two letters out of a complete name. Right. Okay. Is what we have found. And so uh, now another thing on fonts, I've noticed that you're using lettering instead of the monogram button that's right next to it. What's what's that difference? All right, let me just get this off the screen. Sure. Uh, go to embroidery and the monogramming. What monogramming is, is we're selecting a template. This is basically pre-digitized uh, okay. sections if you're doing, you know, someone's initials gotcha. or, uh, you know, in a circle. You simply select it. Characters, let's say uh, S, G, C. And then there you've got your monogram text oh, for, okay. I get you it. know, labels, collars, you know, stuff. book bags, yeah, little stuff. That would be what the monogramming is for. Okay. Um, now, once again, since I know the hot pick, the, the bling side a little bit better, um, what's the relationship between doing vector graphics in CorelDRAW and Illustrator and bringing them into Sierra? How does that? Um, the same way we brought images over here, Okay. you'd be able to choose your raster images, vector images, or we'll show you all the images. Simply left click, drag it on the screen, and of course vector images, they're nice, clean, sharp, defined areas. Right. Those are the images that work best when you are doing uh, the auto trace. Because simply by clicking on a section and pressing enter, they're clean to find their sharp images, yeah. and it's a lot easier to do the auto digitizing with a vector image. Gotcha. Um, but not always do customers have vector images. Right. A lot of times customers bring in a T-shirt with a design on it. They want you to scan it in and go from that. It does make it tricky. It does make it difficult. The main thing when you digitize is look at the object, define what goes first, second, third, fourth, all the way up, and then. It, you don't have to have everything in the design when you're sewing. You know, you could leave a lot of detailed designs is, um, uh, let me see, let me find one. So we'll grab this one. You know, in here, uh, some of the small sections, I might leave this little line out right here in his eye and just have the top part because it's so small, it's not going to sew. You're not going to see it. So when you're looking at a design, and it's got a lot of stitches right here. I might just do one of these, maybe do okay. every other one, depending on the size. If this is for a left chest, I would do every other one of these. So when it sews, they're not closed up and it looks clump. It right. actually defines, and you get the shadowing effect that you're trying to get. So that's a good question. So the yellow in that design, mm -hmm. um, would you leave that out so you just so it just pokes through to see the shirt? Is that something that you If it's do? a yellow shirt, I would digitize it, leave okay. that section out. Um, if you're doing a blue shirt, you can leave the blue out. Okay. Um, so when you're digitizing, it depends on the color of the shirt you're using. If you can leave it out and it looks good, leave it out. Otherwise, you can also do things as applique. Okay, describe that. Applique would be, say, for example, instead of leaving the yellow shirt, you can actually have this as fabric. So you would digitize it, just a satin border along the outside, this inside yellow would be the fabric of your choice, whether it be a yellow, a yellow denim, um, yellow satin, um, cotton. As it, Basically what it does, it cuts, cuts out of your stitch count. Okay. So you still get a nice, clean effect 
less stitches, less time sewing. Again, you can still charge the customer just the same amount. Is the how's the setup time difference between? So if I'm doing fifty, you know, of these, for example, would it be less expensive for me to do applique or less expensive for me to just cut that out? Um, since you, since you're doing say fifty of them, right? You're probably going to get the the images or the shapes you're doing for that design pre-cut from another company. Okay. Or if you've got your own cutter and you plotter, you can do it yourself. Great. Okay. Um, so since they're predefined, all you're doing is when you sew on the sewing machine, it's going to stop. You lay your fabric down, you press start, it sews it down, finishes the design. So you lose no time whatsoever, yet your design will probably finish faster because you are less stitches. You'll probably cut out, depending on the size, if it's a jacket back, a good 10,000 stitches on that yellow part. Gotcha. So but, you, but, if, but if it was a left chest, you probably wouldn't bother. I would do it, yeah. Usually when you do appliques, it's usually jacket back appliques. Okay, so it's big. Yeah, they're big designs. Any questions? Okay, I do see uh, one simple one, and that is um, what's the relationship between the design that you're working on and the size of the hoop that you'll be using? Um, whenever you digitize and you go to sew it out, you want to sew it out in a hoop that's just a little bit larger than the design. Okay. For example, I, if I do this as a left chest, say four inches wide, I'm not going to put it in the 12 by 12 jacket back hoop. You'll have too much fabric play on the outside. It'll, it'll give too much on the, on the t-shirt. It'll pull. You'll have gaps. Okay. Probably a wrinkle effect. I so get that. if it's a four inch, you want to do it, uh, the hoop just a little bit larger, like the six inch or the five and a half inch. Now, I noticed on the embroidery um, tab that there is a hoops button. What does that do? This allows you to come in here and select a specific hoop that you have that you're going to be sewing with. And you see we've got a wide range from Baby Lock to Bernina to Brother, uh, Cams, Elna, just different hoop styles. So, um, so if you know, if you've got a... Um, 16 by 16 hoop, mm -hmm. and you can pick whatever brand there as long as it's 16 by 16. 16. And let's see what it looks like. What does it look like on screen? Yeah, let's say we'll, we'll choose this 10 by, by 7 and 8. Okay. And we'll click OK. And you can see the, the highlighted white area is the size of the hoop. Okay, and that was a square hoop. That was a square hoop. Okay, I get it. So if we come up here. And let's just choose a round hoop, which you can see over here, uh, an image of what it will look like. There's a round one. We'll choose the 7.8. Click OK. And that's your design. Okay. So if you've got a design you're working with that is this size, you know it's not going to fit in that hoop. You want to go back to your hoops and possibly choose a larger one so that your design fits in there. Okay. That's good. So that's a, a, a good tool um, to go with. Okay. All right, we've got uh, we've got last call for questions here. First of all, Sean, are there any other common questions that you get that you wanted to keep these nice people from calling you about in the next week or so? <laughs> mm. uh, well, one of the main things you do want to do when you're done digitizing, a lot of times, you know, for example, the, the the image here, you see where the two zeros meet. It's basically right here on this on the cat. So when you send to the embroidery machine, the embroidery machine sees as the center of this design being where those two zeros meet. Mm -hmm. So when you're done digitizing, you're ready to sew, the one thing I would do is up in the embroidery tab is you go to your start in button, come down to start, you want to start at first section. Go back to end and you want to do your end point at your last section. Once you've done that, then center the design and you notice the two zeros meet now in the center of this these two designs combined, which are sitting right here. Right. Okay. So when you send it to your broader machine and you trace it, you know you're in the middle of that design and not offset. Gotcha. There are some uh, calls I've had where the design has been sitting way out to the side over here, not where the two zeros meet. Customer thinks it's in the middle. They go to trace, and yet it's tracing out larger than what it's supposed to be, and they can't understand why. They've got it centered in the middle of the hoop. The reason is their design most likely is offset from where the two zeros meet. So that's simply just come back to embroidery, do your start and your end, and then end it with center, and that's going to put the zeros in the dead middle of your design so that when you center it on the, on the machine, good one. 
It's okay. even traced out. You know exactly where it is. That's great. That's great. Okay, guys. Well, um, thank you for your attention today. I hope that you uh, you got something out of these 45 minutes on uh, refreshing your knowledge of Stitch Era Liberty. And you're going to get an email from us probably uh, sometime tomorrow. If you think of anything that you would like us to cover next time or something we missed or you have a question uh, for Sean about using Stitch Era Liberty, just hit reply and uh, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. And um, that will do it. Thanks, everybody, for attending.